means to do that. Yeah, protect people. Protect. And that's a different story. Mm -hmm. More work for Christina. I'm not so sure it should be happening. Who? Cool. Well, because Christina will have to keep that and you know, stay together. So <laughs> the editing, the building, the this, the that. All right, guys. So is this the clicker? That's the clicker. The, the thing doesn't work because it's a TV, right? The pointer. So it's <coughs> no problem. All right. So let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Avi Rappaport. I have my PhD done at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, Department of Economics. I had Eugene Fama and Lars Hansen win the Nobel Prize a quarter before my defense. Lucky them, <laughs> and lucky me for them, uh, letting me out. They were in a good mood, so it was like everyone was uh, having a good time. And this is uh, my thesis, uh, Supply and Demand Shocks in the Oil Market. It's split up into two papers. One's an empirical paper, which how I started it. It started by observing an empirical phenomenon, and then I added a theory paper on top of that because the, I guess the empirics weren't enough to get away from uh, the University of Chicago Book School of Business and the Department of Economics. The motivation a little bit, oil is the biggest physical commodity input. Its share of GDP is about 5%, but declining. So if you want to really generalize this, I don't know if you can, uh, because its share is declining and other things in the economy are taking a much bigger role. But uh, in, pa in the past, uh, disruptions in this uh, commodity has, have had uh, effects on the, on the rest of the economy. World oil production value is about $2 trillion per year. Crude oil weight in the commodity index is about 60%. Uh, for the motivation, what are the differences in the macroeconomic effects of a change in the price of oil when it's due to an oil market specific shock, such as wars in the Middle East or expectations of war in the Middle East or uncertainty as regards to wars in the Middle East as opposed to being due to an economy-wide shock that is not specifically related to the oil market, such as unexpected booms and busts in the economy, such as a global recession, that affect demand for all assets. Okay, let me, let me, let me give you a spoiler about the answers. Uh, actually, before that, let me jump to this, because uh, we all like to look at pretty pictures. And this kind of summarizes it. This is it. What are we looking at? There's the black. The black line is the log, log value of the price of oil. 983 till 2011. I do have it extended at the end as a favor for someone. He asked me to do it. I asked him, well, that's a lot of work. I do this for you. You need to do something for me. And then I did it. But then he didn't follow through and did his part. Sometimes that happens. <laughs> so this is an extended version. goes all the way to 19, uh, 2016. So what can we see is that whenever, and the dots, what are the dots? The dots are the correlation between oil price changes, daily frequency, okay, the, the log change in the price of oil spot on a given day, plus 1%, minus 1%, and the return in the aggregate stock market, okay, with dividends. Then the correlation between these returns over a period of the days in a month. So every dot is a month, it has about 20 observations, and that's how I calculate the correlation. It's really simple, it's a, it's a shorthand, it's not a structural VAR, there is a structural VAR somewhere else in the paper, I hope we don't get to it. <laughs> and uh, so what can we see? The red ones are just when they are significantly different than zero, and the blue ones is just when uh, they're not. So you can see 
For example, check out the Gulf War. So really in August 1990, when the Gulf War broke off, you had a, almost a doubling of the oil price. And at the same time, this was associated with very negative correlations on a daily frequency between the oil price change and the returns in the stock market. Okay, so that means that in the background, you don't see it here, that stock markets went down. Which stock market is that? It's, it's the aggregate, either the US or the global. It's not, I didn't do a cross section. I did this part of checks, but there, there was nothing to be revealed there. That might be it. There is an interesting question whether it's an oil importer, oil exporter, but as a whole, the world is an oil consumer. So um, then when the, uh, the war uh, ended, you had the price of oil go down, price of stocks recover, and again, this manifested in very negative correlation. Okay, so you could feel that there was a, an adverse oil specific shock that affected the rest of the stock market. Actually, this is the, the broad stock market x the oil stocks, oil producing stocks. So I take out the, uh, the, the index of the oil producers. And then when it reversed, there was also a reversal, and the negative correlation maintained. Then every other time, if you don't have something specific in the Middle East, the correlation is kind of at zero. Some other events had something with the Iraq here. Here, this was a big drop in the price of oil. Uh, Saudi Arabia was increasing production. They were kind of breaking off from the cartel. They said, we had enough, everyone else is cheating, we're gonna cheat too. And that's what happened. So again, it was the, 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 it was the tail wagging the dog. So if the dog is the economy, the tail is the oil market, something's happening at the oil market, this has some sort of an effect on the rest of the economy. You had 9-11, which oil spiked up for a while, then it tanked again, then it tanked, the Iraq war. So here prices went up on the expectation that there would be a war. So 2003 or 2002, I think George W. Bush, he passed this in Congress, that there will be a war for sure, because back in the day you had to by down and uh, get approval from the Congress to start a war. And uh, that's when the price of oil went up a little bit and stocks got nervous and you see this in the negative correlation. And this is, here is really when I started uh, to pay attention and have this idea to write a thesis about this. Because this was the period when oil was running up to 2007 kind of breaking all-time highs, and all over the newspapers, it was said that stock markets are going down because oil price is so high and rising. All this time, they didn't say anything, color correlation was kind of zero or positive, price of oil was going up together with the stock market, nobody was saying anything, and then when it really kind of got to nosebleed uh, highs, you saw for four months, really corresponding to this peak, that the correlation was very negative. So maybe this is speculation. Um, there could be four of these oil market specific shocks, either an oil production flow, like the first Gulf War, where really the war started unexpectedly and almost immediately then, and there was a disrupt actual disruption in production. This a precautionary shock, where in just like the second Gulf War, uh, it was announced this year that next year will be a disruption. Okay, and then if people can anticipate that, then they start hoarding oil now. 
so that increases demand for spot oil to keep in the in the coffers and that increases the price of oil it could be a precautionary of motive too like uncertainty if the flow is stochastic then um, we imagine that the, the standard deviation of the error increases then this is also if you have a disutility if the world has, has disutility from having low levels of oil and now all of a sudden the flow has become more volatile then as a precautionary savings you increase the amount of oil you have uh, in storage and that increases the demand for oil now and increases its price or you could just have speculation meaning just the price of oil goes up uh, above and beyond what is uh, suggested by uh, you know the fundamental variables of the economy uh, then there's an economy-wide shock so all of these are grouped together I can't really tell them apart because the delta just does not lend itself for such uh, minute differentiation so all of these are lumped together and identified as a non-market specific shock by the magnitude and, and sign of the correlation. If it's negative correlation, then I say it's an oil market specific shock. It could be either one of these. I have an idea which one was more than the other for each of these, but I really don't take it to the data because it's just not feasible. And then an economy wide shock is the one. Is this okay there's two things conflated here one is that during the Great Recession and the recovery after oil prices of course tanked together with stock prices everything went down together and that produced at a daily frequency very positive correlations for a very long time and uh, so this suggests that of course this was something that was not specific to the oil market this was the dog wagging the tail the dog being the economy the tail being the oil market and there is also a seemingly secular increase in the correlation where perhaps around this time came out all these oil tracking ETFs made it more accessible for retail and other investors to place capital with uh, with oil then flows coming in and out to oil were uh, you know more correlated with how flows go in and out from uh, the other asset prices such as stocks uh, so this seems to be a, a secular increase but then again even amongst this very positive red cloud of correlations for the one month February 2011, we, when you had the Libya war, it jumped to very negative territory. Okay, this was really a small event. You don't really see it in the grand scheme of the oil price change, but on a monthly, the markets were really nervous and it was going in a very negative direction, negative correlation. So you might say that it's become more integrated all the time that if it's dominated by by the economy then it's more positive the correlation to other asset, risky asset classes such as stocks but at the time where you had, do have something in the Middle East it jumps back to very negative then we jump back back to positive okay, and then here the recent decline well, since then it kind of stopped and not really recovered too much but kind of stopped and stabilized then there's not much could be said of this seems to be kind of a mix of both both supply and demand any questions you guys should ask what so what do we do with this from 
from one type of investment to be uh, to be easier to something like that. Have you tested that? No. no. So it's just uh, an idea, but yeah, uh, there are some papers out there. Oh. There are some papers out there that uh, show that something kind of structurally changed around 2004 or five with the introduction of these ETFs that made it more accessible to, to the larger part of the, of the investment community to, to get access to, to purchase oil futures. Maybe they shouldn't participate in this market at all. I don't know if you just hold oil in the tanker or if you just roll over oil futures. There's the, as a passive investor, I don't know that there's a reason for you to get a positive expected return on your capital. It's not clear. Also, if uh, you know, I buy a bunch of these chairs and hold them in storage, I wouldn't expect to get a positive expected return on them. It's just food for thought. And then what is this good for? What can we do with this? So I tried to do as much as I can. I did quite a lot. So let's see. Right, so I said, why don't we try to predict five macro variables of interest? GDP growth rate, future GDP growth rates, future ex post realized excess returns in the stock market. Can we make alpha out of this? No one wants to make alpha, even if they don't have capital to deploy it. They just want to find it. And the kind of uh, complementary to that, can we uh, predict aggregate dividend growth rates in the stock market? And a few others. I constructed a predictor. Constructed a predictor that uh, identifies an oil price change by the uh, correlation, the sign and the magnitude uh, of that of this correlation that I've shown you. So if it's so if it's positive. The correlation, I create a series like this. So it's a series between 1 and 0, and anything in the middle, whatever the correlation sign was. I call this rho positive. And rho negative is the same thing with absolute value. So it's a series of numbers between 0 and 1. And then I use the, these two to scale the monthly oil price change. So say the oil price, change, oil price change was 10% uh, during this month. It was associated with a very negative correlation, so that's one. So this predictive variable will have a value of plus 10%, okay? And this one will have zero. This one is for the oil specific, and this one is for the economy one. If the correlation was very positive, then that month's oil price change would lag as variable in this in this variable. Okay, and then I try to. It's not a VAR with error. Okay, it's a shortcut. But uh, then I average these out over three months. And you can you can interpret these two variables, two predictive variables. The oil market specific one. I call them epsilon as if they're errors from a VAR. It's not far from that. It's a predictive variable interpreted as changes in the price of oil that are due to oil market specific shocks identified by a negative correlation between oil price changes and stock market returns. And the other variable, it's a predictive variable interpreted as changes in the price of oil that are due to economy wide shocks identified by a positive correlation between oil price changes and stock market. And this is how it looks like. So this is the Gulf War. You see it spiked up and then reversed. Same thing when Saudi increased production kind of exogenously. Spiked down and spiked up. 
And everywhere, even the smaller events with the second Iraq war, spiked up, then spiked down. This bout of speculation when it reached all-time highs spiked up, then spiked down. And then the Libya war was also a spike up, then spiked down. It's just that I couldn't capture it at that thick frequency. And if you have the feel for predictability in asset prices, then if this, uh, if this is followed by this, and this is followed by that, 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 then you would get a beta there. You would get a beta there for predictability in asset prices, both on the stock market future excess returns and on the excess returns in oil futures investing. Okay, let's sell this to a hedge fund. So the um, choice of correlation magnitude is given on whether the correlation is statistically significant to the performance you provide on both cases. I, uh, that was a, a check, a robustness check, but in the main results I just take whatever correlation. If it's kind of 0 0.5, or 0 0.25, yeah. then you get a smaller variation. Okay. So it's really uh, I don't I don't count out that information. But I have it as a robustness check. Trust me, University of Chicago, they make me do a lot. <laughs> and this is another kind of way to look at what this thing is. And so I can combine these two variables, okay? So I say, take this, multiply by minus one, and add this. So then you have a combined predictor. Uh, anyway, let's, let's, let's just look at them differently before we combine them. Because I only combine them for, so we have less predictive variables. But let's just keep them separate. But we are expecting them to have different effects on what we are predicting. So let's start with a cool thing. Uh, 12 months, stock market, aggregate stock market, excess returns. Okay, so from month T plus one to T plus 12, some of the regular controls, like dividend yield and term spread and default spread for the four lags of this combined variable. So you can have, we can take the four of the oil market specific and four uh, economy wide. See here, these are four oil specific and four economy wide. Okay, and you can see you get positive coefficients on the oil specific, negative coefficients on the economy wide. So what does this mean? This is even for controlling for stock market returns at the same lag. So what did I do here? So here the blue line is the 12 months realized excess returns in the stock market. And the red line is the expected return. It's the beta times the realization of the lag variables. So you can see this one is the easiest to remember. Stock markets went down here. If you remember, because oil price went up here and it was associated with very negative correlation. And afterwards, my model predicts you would have very positive excess returns, almost 30% in the stock market. That's not bad. If you get 30% one year, every year, once every six months, you can be rich real quick. Depends how big your balance sheet is. And how loosely your investment mandate is. And on the other hand, so just, just keep in mind here that the variable that captures oil price changes due to oil market specific shocks went up, went up a lot here, right? 
because the correlation was negative, you take the absolute value, so it's kind of like 1 times the 100%, which was the rise in the price of oil here. So the predictor variable was positive here. And then afterwards you had an increase. That's why you have positive coefficients on the oil market specific. And here, on the other hand, everything tagged together. This is a stock market crash, and you had the oil crash here. So the predicted variable uh, for the oil market, uh, for the for the economy-wide chalk, has had a negative value. Okay, because it, it was a decline times a, a, a positive correlation, and then afterwards you had a big recovery. See, this captured this big recovery. And that's why you have here a negative coefficient. So the, all the bouncing back is captured very well, actually very well, but not the, the markets going down. Right. Uh, is that because the size of the shorts were somewhat smaller or are they less well uh, estimated uh, because you have two components there and you made the point earlier what am I actually looking at is the sharp reversal mm -hmm. in the first line yeah but the second line which means the economy wide they didn't have a lot of variability in to be able to capture something reasonable in a sense I mean it's reasonable in the sense of what it does but not in the size and and this is then reflected in this in this chart because you're saying if I'm looking forward, the only information that I can actually count on in terms of asset pricing is the bet on reversal based on the correlation in caused by oil specific shocks, not economy wide shocks. I, I agree, I agree with you. This is uh, for the economy, this yeah. comes from the economy wide series. Yeah. So this is huge predictability as if. Uh, but I don't see this as the main contribution to this paper because everyone knows that you should buy stocks in a recession and afterwards you get excessive returns. If you have a capital and if your pension uh, you know, advisor didn't tell you to sell, then you could have captured this. You don't need to be a genius and you don't need uh, a, a variable mm -hmm. that has to do with oil. What does oil have in this particular case? So really, uh, but I wanted to frame this as an academic question. What is the difference in predictability between this type of shock or that type of shock identified this way? So yeah, it's cool that it came out opposite signs, that an oil, meaning an oil price increase due to something in the Middle East predicts higher excess returns in the stock market going forward, but an oil price increase that is due to a boom in the economy might predict lower excess returns in the future. But I don't put too much weight on this. I wouldn't put money on this in particular. But this one could be interesting. I mean, even in Libya, so the last, last time we saw it was in Libya, it was real quick because these things are, they're going away because it's a lot smaller part of the economy and people don't get nervous so much. People still get nervous with stupid things like Brexit. I mean, the stock market went down 4-5% on Brexit, but who even cares about a little island called Britain? Why should the S&P go down 5% on that? Stock markets went down, Trump got elected, and quickly reversed. So these things are harder to trade, but even here, the stock, I don't know exactly, but stock markets went down like minus one, oil went up plus two, and then another few days like this, and then they converge back. So you got three, four percent in there if you already had it pre programmed. But of course, that's a whole different uh, kind of animal to pre program this. So, any questions there? So I, can, so I know where to take this with you guys because there's lots more. So you, did, you, you, you mentioned you did some structural estimation. Yes. That would be interesting because you know we're interested, we have some 
gaps in terms of forecasting and trying to understand how oil feeds into, into the broad economy? So let's do that. So I'm skipping all the empirical uh, discussion. So let me just summarize the, 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 what I found. Okay, so we found that oil market specific causes dividends today and in the future to go up if it causes the price of oil to go up. And for the excess returns, I showed it to you. And then I, I have five results, actually. This was the dividends. See, now I'm jumping. And for GDP, so if an oil market specific shock, this is the GDP. An oil market specific shock causing the price of oil to go up leads to lower GDP but an oil market shock leading to an oil price increase that is due to economy-wide event is actually associated with higher GDP growth rate. Okay, that's the cool thing from the, for the academic. You do one thing or another, you get opposite results. That's why it's kind of interesting for, for academics. And just remember these um, and then I tried to predict also the future oil price change. As you saw, because it reverses, then you have predictability there. And similarly, uh, the returns from going long oil futures. And that's already an excess return in the investing futures. So it's, it hits where, you said it's, it, where it's supposed to hit. See, that's the Gulf War commencement. That's the reversal. And you really capture the reversal. And same thing in other places, but small, small. And, the, and here, when everything tied together, you captured with the other set of variable, the recovery. And now we get to the DSG model. Because the DSG model is meant to try to explain all this, kind of square it all in a Lars Hansen kind of way. So if the first point, that's the Gene Fama, now we're going to Lars Hansen. And uh, yeah, it was not easy. So let's see where it is. Or it could be in a different presentation. Uh, that's not good. So let me quickly try to get the other presentation. I apologize. Maybe I can access Dropbox.
this GE model. I know you guys are very excited about it. Yeah, you can forget about it. It's not going to be strong. Oh, no. Because it's 